He's a professor and graduate program coordinator for the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry right down the road at North Carolina Central University. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Fei Yan. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. All right, so uh, again, today will be my first presentation for this evening, and the topic, as you can see, is talking about how we can estimate the, um, the time of death for submerged bodies. So uh, I just want to quickly talk about the place I'm working right now. It's uh, the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Central. We do have three degree programs. The first one is a bachelor's degree in chemistry, including forensic science. And the next one, we do have a standalone master program. We are also part of the PhD program, so-called Integrated Bioscience. A quick question for the audience. It's supposed to be a sound right now. All right, everybody knows. All right, good, excellent. So I guess most people grew up with the, watching those crime shows. So for the last 20, 30 years, right, you can see all kinds of crime shows going on. This actually, you know, very popularized this, this field of forensic science. You know, this inspired a lot of young people go into this field, so-called forensic science, right? So this is happening in the last 20, 30 years. There's something called CSI effect. All right, so uh, today we're a little bit technical here. We're trying to you know, look into this particular topic, most importantly for the investigation involving deaths, right? You see the body, and then what are we gonna do? So most importantly, we need to find out when this body you know, was actually dead, right? So the time since death is one of the crucial tasks for the forensic investigation. And it turns out there's two purposes for this. First of all, we need to find out to estimate the time frame, right, for this particular event. And secondly, we may be able to limit the number of suspect, suspect, you know, for the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the criminal cases. As you can see, uh, when the body, you know, died, uh, following the death, the body undergoes a, a, a series of chemical and, and physical changes. You know, for example, temperature drops, the muscle stiffens, and some of the chemical in terms of potassium, the sodium, glucose level actually, you know, either decrease or increase. In the case of potassium, the, uh, the, the potassium level is actually increases once the, the body, you know, ceases the normal activities. As you can see, that we have done many kind of research about this, but unfortunately, there's still a big gap, right? It's, there's still at this point, there's no single method allow us to really be able to detect that. So there's still a lot of challenge on, on that. But t t today, the, the case become even more complex. You know, talking about body found in the, in the water, you know, there's, there's, there's all, you know the, the, the chemical reaction would be very different from what happened in, on, on land. And as you look at the statistics, you know, the global you know, health organization, you know, the, the, the number third, you know, number third uh, the leading cause for, uh, uh, for the unintended, uh, unintentional injury was caused by drowning. And in, in the United States alone, almost like 3,000 people died of drowning. So it, it's, it's a big problem right there. So again, I don't want to, too much of the context. As you can see, uh, our focus, this particular research, which I did uh, you know, during my, you know, the PhD period, but uh, it's talking about, we are trying to emphasize, look at the, this so-called adipocere formation. As you can see, our body fat undergoes a couple of chemical changes, you know, talking about, uh, you know, breakdowns, the fats will break down into those, you know, two, two, two components. And basically, the, there's a glycerol component, and there's another piece which will be made of all this long chain so-called fatty acids. There's two types of fatty acids. One is so-called saturated. As you can see, the difference between saturated and unsaturated is the double bond, right? So the second one does not really fully covered with hydrogen. So again, I wanna move on with my topic here. Uh, we don't have the human body to, to really study, so we work with the uh, collaboration with the, the regional crime lab. We use the pig cadaver, cadavers as, as a human model, and we decided to put it into three different types of waters, right? So let's see what happens. 
as you can see, we get sample every two weeks up to 10 weeks. So we study that using one of the techniques, so-called HPLC. Anybody here chemist? HPLC, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's one of the most, most powerful technique separation, right? You can separate stuff very nicely, you know, even though they're very much the same, as you can see. You know, those are the fatty acids which are commonly uh, as part of the adiposphere. You can see the number of carbons, very close, right? 18 carbons, you know, a lot of hydrogens. So they are structurally very similar. The only difference is maybe just a little less carbon. Some of them has the, uh, the, the, the double bond. So HPLC is gonna allow us to do just that. So when we started, as you can see, you know, quickly we will be able to identify, you know, when you look at those, those particularly, you know, look at the, the, the in, in second hour, uh, the, the, the sample was immersed in, in the water. This is one type of sample. As you can see, we will be able to see those peaks. One of the peaks, it's, it's very obvious to us, is the oleic acid, right? That's one of the things we're talking about. As you notice, there's a double bond in oleic acid. And we also notice that there's a disappearance of that particular peak, not disappearance, the peak height decreases while there's something else, you know, is going to appear. So the, there seems to be a correlation between those two things. So we did our complete study with those three different types of samples. So as you can see, uh, there is a very nice trend. As you notice, uh, look at those three different types of waters. In the DI water, the, um, as you look at the ratio, we look at the numbers, right? Look at HPLC. We check the intensity of this, uh, this so-called 10 hydroxy steric acid and, and, and uh, use that uh, divide by the amount of oleic acid. There's a general trend, this number that you know, did increase over time. This happened with the DI water. However, with the salt water is a different case, right? Different story. Uh, the, uh, the chlorinated water also happens differently. So the, pr the explanation we have is that as you people already noticed that the transition from one of the fatty acid, in this case, oleic, oleic acid, to the other, you know, fatty acid, is all due to the bacteria actions. So the, the amount of bacteria in the water is going to make a huge difference. So as you can see, we actually be able to, for the first time, be able to come up with a semi-quantitative uh, approach. So we can really tie it to the, this particular number, right? You can, you can kind of match out, you know, what, what's, you can kind of give a good, good estimate if this body in the, uh, is, is immersed in the, in, the, in the water. But in any case, this is only works for this peak. As you remember, each sample dot is average of six data points. It's not just one data. So statistically, this trend it really happens when we have this particular you know, peak cadaver samples put in the water, things will happen, you know, fatty acid you know, switch from one type to another. So this is one of the you know, first study you know, using this, this quantitative approach you know, to, to really try to tie to the, uh, we have much better idea now if we can, you know, of course this has to be done with human, you know, cadavers to make, to make sure it really can be used for the investigation. But in any case, this, this was published a couple of years ago. Uh, there's some citations so far. So this is, seems to be a, one of the approach we can probably, you know, pursue for the future. So again, I guess I just wanna kind of encourage everybody in the audience to, Really, you know, think outside the box. You know, can we come up with a, a novel solution to some of the old problems, right? Everybody has the old problems. So, so this is one way I just want to make sure I get the, this particular example to show that it is possible, right? To look at the problem at a new perspective. Uh, with that, I think uh, I do have some, I think this is all I have for today. I'm not sure about timing as used. I think I run pretty quickly. Oop. Hey, right. there I am. Thank you very much. All right, give it up for Dr. Fei Yan. <laughs> and if any of you have grave wax on the bingo card we passed out when you came in, please mark that down. There will be a prize. Now, question and answer about Dr. Yan's research. We've got one coming right here, right up front. Here we go. What is your question? Um, I was just curious if, like, you know, after the two-week mark, do, do the peaks change any, like, more drastically? Like, let's say you were to you know, pull a sample at, like, 16 weeks. Would it look significantly different than at the two weeks? Yeah, that study, again, uh, we were quite limited by the, the sample we were provided. So originally we designed, yeah, this could be very different, maybe continue, maybe kind of, uh, you know, maybe reach a point which no more changes. So this is mostly likely going to happen. But, uh, in fact, uh, this particular 
uh, decomposition takes some time, could be take years. So this could be, you know, most cases, some of the body from the body waters for so long, in fact, uh, it was actually preserved because of the formation of adipose C, right? It's like a, you know, gray wax. So it actually changed this, uh, this, uh, this profile, you know, so the composition becomes, again, it's not like uh, in, in, the, in the land. So, the, yeah, in fact, uh, if the study can continue with more than 12 weeks, we could uh, anticipate a continued uh, increase of the numbers, but at some point, this should reach, you know, a, a plateau. All right, next question, right front and center as well. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, what's the current resolution for identifying time of death using methods like this, and is there a variance between different freshwater sources for that sensitivity? Uh, I didn't quite catch the, the yeah, what's the, what, what's the question again? Can you repeat that? Just want to make sure I got the... So that how much confidence can you place in the time of death using methods like this? So that can you say it's, you know, two days ago, two weeks ago, four weeks ago? Yeah, this one, I think this, for this particular indicator, we may need to do some, uh, this is for the long, for the advanced stage of decomposition. We cannot do like two days, four days. This, this has to, you know, the more the, 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 the body was immersed in the, in the water, and the, more, the more accurate, because it does take time for the bacteria to work. So yeah, I think we are not gonna work in for the early stage of decomposition. I'm not sure anybody knows, after death, there's roughly how many stages of of decomposition. Anybody knows the answer? A body dies. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the textbook says maybe eight, maybe it could be up to 10, you know, different phases, right? Talking about the, the temperature drops, then maybe the first phase, right? And then other stuff happening. All right, we've got another question right here. You said there was a potassium buildup in the body. <clears throat> Is that because of a mismatch between the metabolism and the, you know, the breakdown of the uh, uh, molecules, or what is the reason of that? The, yeah, the reason, actually, yeah, the, we are specifically looking at the potassium level at the uh, vitreous humor of the eyes. So there's a study shows that uh, you know, when bodies stop functioning, the sodium, the chloride, the level will drops. That's, that's had to be from the vitreous, from the, from the humor of the eyes, only from the, the, the vitreous fluid uh, of the, the humor. So the potassium, its uh, level increases. I think uh, I have to check this morning, you know, why this increases. Yeah, there's influxes of potassium from other places, but it's in a very predictable way. So the change is very much predictable. So this is common knowledge in the forensic science field. You can actually use the... Um, you know, the, the, the potassium level in, in the vitreous, um, you know, humor of the eyes to, to kind of, similarly to the, the same correlation, there is a correlation has been established. This, of course, is only for the body found on land, not gonna be happening for the body in the submerged. That would be a different, you know, chemistry. But uh, yeah, there is a well-known idea, the potassium level does increase if the body stop, stop working. All right, our last question will come from the gentleman in the UNC hat here. So I'm not a scientist, but uh, so you drown pigs. Do you, are these live pigs when they're drowned and are they anesthetized first or are they already dead and they're drowned or I mean? How? Yeah, the, uh, this. And, and then I have another question, which is there's a difference in the water and how the de decomposition happens because of bacteria. Uh, can you tell us more about what bacteria we're talking about? Yeah, I, I did not know that. There's, this is beyond me, what are the bacteria, but the, the first question is the, the, you know, this pig samples was uh, provided to us by the, uh, one of the regional labs. I didn't really know how, how they actually do, do the thing or not, whether they kill the pig or whatever. Yeah, I'm not knowing sure about that detail. We are just getting sample every two weeks from them. So I, I, at that time, with this collaboration, I just didn't know about this specific detail. But uh, in terms of the bacteria, it's also a, uh, a well-known uh, in the field of, uh, you know, this uh, fatty acid, uh, this adiposeal field. I don't know the name of the enzyme. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the, the particular, the uh, field, the, the, the biologist, the field, but uh, there is an enzyme which actually, yeah, which actually, specific enzyme will be able to turn this oleic acid to the, this particular one, this hydroxy uh, stearic acid. So I just didn't know them. I didn't, I, because I didn't really pay, yeah, I know that, 
I saw the, the paper, but I didn't remember the name, but there's a, there's a particular enzyme which works for that particular transformation. All right, folks, give it up for Dr. Fay. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah.